If you're trapped in a house with zombies trying to get in, you need a solution. But if your car is a mile away and your dead jerk-off brother Johnny has the keys, what do you do? You bust that damn door down and kill some fucking zombies until you find that loser and then you bash his brains in. Why? Because Johnny has the keys. Johnny has the keys, the podcast of horror and sci-fi that shapes our lives. With your hosts, David Horton and Tim Smith, lifelong friends introduced and bound by their love of the genres. And now, your host, Tim and David. Hello, hello, hello out there in podcast land. You have reached Johnny Has the Keys, a podcast about horror and science fiction where we look at movies, television, literature, all those kind of things, uh, movies and uh, genre influences on our lives and on other works of genre. And my name is David. I'm here with my great friend, Tim. Hey, Tim, how are you? I'm doing well, David. What's going on out there in the world? Anything? Uh, just stuff. Stuff. Let's see. What have I done this week? Uh, well, two things genre related. I watched uh, The Witcher, which is a new series on Netflix, uh, and it's based on a book series that was also a very popular RPG game, um, very fantasy oriented. <laughs> People are saying, "Oh, if you're you know if you're Jones in for Game of Thrones, then this is the next thing." Whatever. Uh, it is good. It's a really well done. Uh, it's a good series, well acted. Um, the lead in it is uh, uh, Cavill, the guy that played uh, Superman, Superman in the DC movies. Yeah. Yeah, I um, have a friend that um, is into the gaming stuff, and he has been watching it and telling me about it. So I tried to watch the first episode, and I guess I just wasn't buying it, so I just flipped. Um, <laughs> it, it starts with that giant spider, you know, coming out of the water. And I was like, wait a minute. There is way too much CGI going on for the first few frames of this show. <laughs> well, true. And true. I was like, I don't but, know. You know. I may give fights, it another shot. Well, he fights monsters, you know, so that's kind of the whole thing. Um, so it's like a Van Helsing of the fantasy world? Yeah, basically he, and, and I don't know as much because I have not played the game, although several people have recommended it to me, and I have not read the book. So all I have to base it on is what I saw in the series. And basically he is a, uh, in this world, sorcerers are a league all of their own. They're the Brotherhood, and they um, kind of every kingdom has one sorcerer, you know, kind of like Camelot sort of thing. Um and there are monsters and creatures and dwarfs and elves. So it is set up in a similar fantasy line to all the other, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, Tolkien, all the other fantasies. But the exception is that at a very young age, children are taken and through magic and incantation and whatever, we don't know the process yet based on the series, these children are turned into witchers. And witchers are essentially monster hunters. So, yeah, to your point, Van Helsing. They have limited magic ability, but they have incredible fighting ability and hypersensory. So they can sense things, read minds, hear, you know, all this kind of stuff. And um, the series takes place years and years and years later where there are very few witchers left. Something happened and they can't make them anymore. And we don't know what. Yeah, I'm assuming that will come out in you know, future seasons or whatever. But so he's one of the last remaining witchers. And some people like him and utilize his skills. And basically he roams the countryside and does all these, you know, kills, you know, monster of the week kind of things. Um, but other people are very prejudiced against him because they don't understand witchers. So sometimes he gets run out of town. Sometimes burn him. That kind of thing. Yeah, burn him. Turn <laughs> me into a newt. Uh, let me... <laughs> <laughs> Build a bridge out of him. Um, <laughs> could you? I mean, do you? <clears throat> is anybody behind this that makes me maybe want to watch it further? Like, is there a 
a showrunner or a director or a writer that I know of. Do you know of anybody on this? No. Okay. No, the showrunner is a female I've never heard of before, but obviously she has a really good grasp of the story and the storytelling. I didn't recognize any of the writers or the directors. Okay. So similar to the way Game of Thrones was. I mean, when Game of Thrones started, I didn't know who uh, D and D were, and I didn't know uh, who you know. I knew some of the cast, of course, because you know Bean, Sean Bean was in it, and everything else. But mm-hmm. I didn't recognize. Uh, and I had never read R. R. Martin's books, so kind of similar uh, in that respect of unknowns. But I think they're doing good work. Um, okay. well, I would I at least give it, give it run. a second episode. You know, watch it through the first two episodes to see. Okay. Um, I mean, I saw Henry Cavill really, on um, Graham Norton. He was shelling it, and um, I thought, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> Nothing is making me lean towards it yet. Um, even right. friends suggesting right. it to me, but maybe I should give it another whirl. Yeah, give it and give it a fantasy whirl and, and see. Um, and then my only other thing I've been doing is I've I got uh, I've been reading um, Michael J. Straczynski's autobiography, uh, which is called Becoming Superman, uh, and it's really 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 a good biography. Um, he is the He's the guy who was, uh, well, he um, won an Oscar for The Changeling. He did Babylon 5. Uh, he's done lots of comic books, including Superman. Uh, Didn't he do something a, I like? Wasn't he like with Sense8 or something? Yeah. Did, or he was the writer for Sense8. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they directed and he wrote all that story. Uh, and he makes references to all that in this autobiography. He makes references to when those ideas first kind of... You know, like he'll say, blah, 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 this happened. It wouldn't be for decades that I actually returned to this idea with a little thing that I like to call Sense8. Uh, and, you know, stuff like that. It's really interesting to see his horrible, horrible childhood and how it, uh, uh, how he became what he is. So, really good autobiography if you like reading autobiographies. Yeah. Um, I've been watching a so lot of documentaries. Um on people behind the scenes, but that's not what my thing for the week is. That will be saved for later. Uh, my what thing is for your the thing week. of the week? <laughs> what? Um, well, um, I'm betraying our um, time travel just a bit. Um, but Star Wars recently came out. The mm-hmm. the final saga or whatever. The, the rise, rise of, of Skywalker. <laughs> yeah, as if as if he hasn't risen before. Um, mm-hmm. So I watched The Last Jedi, which mm-hmm. I had been warned against by someone I know pretty well on this podcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. I just uh, sat down and started watching it. And I- I'm I'm curious. First of all, I, I, it's not as good as the one that precedes it, which was The Force Awakens. It's not as bad as the three that preceded The Force Awakens. Mm-hmm. But there's something off. I, I see why you don't like it. One of the reasons I'm not crazy about it is it seems mm-hmm. like they're rehashing too many of the same storylines. Is that – do you get that? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I got I, that, but I got that in Force Awakens too. Force okay. Awakens was not a continuation of a story; it was a reboot back to the original uh, A New Hope, Episode Four. You know, the rise of Luke Skywalker. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, even down. I mean, if you boil it down to the simplest terms, it was a total reboot. I mean, a young person in the desert who doesn't know their skill sets who is taken on by a mentor to fight the galactic empire using an ancient force i mean it's like okay yeah same story (laughs) we just we just gave her we just gave her girl power uh and tried to create a new darth vader in kylo ren right um and the thing that's getting me is they have alluded like Twice, maybe three times directly in this film, you don't know who your parents are. You don't know who your parents are. And I'm like, 
Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. Do not. If you do that, that is going to be so trite and so ridiculous. You know, oh, Leia and Han had a twin that they let go for adoption, and they didn't tell anybody or whatever. I mean, I don't get it. That that really bothered well, me. Well, yeah, there's a lot of let's go. It, it's my over. I could we could do an entire episode on on this, and we we probably should on the Star Wars saga in general. We could. But um, but but well, we try uh, to do uh, good uh, movies most of the time. But, yeah, right. <laughs> But these uh, are very. I mean, but it's very. Um, it's very Disneyized, in my opinion. It's very, you know, and I know that may be insulting to you, and I hope not. But it's very. We are going after the dollar. We're not going after the story. Um, and, you know, we picked JJ because he gave new life to the Star Trek franchise. So maybe he can give new life to the Star Wars franchise, which he did. Force Awakens really blew people away, mostly because he returned to. What George did best, which was practical effects, practical uh, costuming, going to other countries and really filming it rather than green screening everything, you know, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And going back to the same old story. But then J.J. didn't want to do the sequel and said, let's turn the reins over to somebody else. Disney picked Ryan Johnson, who had said before that he had never seen a Star Wars movie before he directed you know it took the job uh that and, sounds like a bad interview <laughs> that sounds right. like when you know you don't get the job <laughs> right um but he said you know, and, and basically i am of that ilk of the fandom and our belief is that he intentionally went into the last jedi saying i'm going to screw with everything that happened in force awakens i'm going to throw everything off i'm going to I'm going to disrupt everything to the point that, you know, we introduced this villain in Force Awakens with Snoke, this supposed emperor type bad guy. And we don't know who he is, where he came from, what his lineage is, how his association with Kylo is, other than they seem to be the Sith and the Padawan, you know, the the, the trainer and the mentor and the trainer, our trainee. And, Ryan Johnson kills him off with just like that, with right. nothing said, and no, you're going. And, what? and in all honesty, he was one of my favorite characters because he yeah. was the evil he, one, you know. Yeah, and he looked really cool. Mm-hmm. Mm. He's going to create Ray and get and turn her essentially into a Mary Sue, which is she can do anything. She's the best pilot. She's never used a lightsaber before in her life, and yet she can fight somebody who's trained on it his entire life. You know, she she can do anything and get out of any situation. Um, everything that was set up in the first movie, he just knocked down and said, we're not going to do it. And treated uh, it like it was the end of a trilogy, not the middle story. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, it's um, just been a like, long time and, since I saw The Force Awakens, so that's why it wasn't fresh on my brain. Well, and like you said, they raised the question of your parents, your parents, your parents. Your parents. What Kylo say? They were nothing. They were nothing. They were traitors. They just gave you up. And you're going, okay, is that true? Is that a lie? Is it, does it matter? You know, whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's not good. And I actually, you know, along those same lines, I went and saw Rise of Skywalker, the last one. And, uh, uh, it doesn't get any better. Uh, just, just saying, you know, go see it yourself and, you know, uh, if you're out there listening to us, too, and you disagree, please let me know what you thought was actually good about The Rise of Skywalker or The Last Jedi. <laughs> um, but yeah. I'm glad you saw it. I'm glad you're catching up. You know, you're only a year behind. So I'm that's only good. a year behind. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen Solo yet. Um, and the only oh, reason... Solo's good. Solo's good. Okay, I, I haven't seen it yet, and the main reason I want to see it is it because is because it has Phoebe Waller, what's her face in it, and I have been watching her show, um, Fleabag, which won a slew mm. of Emmys, and I love her. I think she's fantastic, and I found out she's a droid or something in Solo. Mhm. And she had yeah, never a seen a Star Wars movie, so. She she thought she blew the audition. She was like, I had no idea what to do, and <laughs> she got it anyway. <laughs> have you uh, have you seen Rogue One 
the other independent story. Now that one I have that seen, and I liked that. Yeah, it yeah. was good. Yeah, Robo, yeah. good. Mm-hmm. Solo's good too. The only thing with Solo is if you're going to cast a young actor to play someone as iconic as Harrison Ford, then even playing the Han Solo character, he needs to have some Harrison Ford slash Han Solo mannerisms. Right. In order for us to believe it. And he doesn't. This guy doesn't. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, he should have <clears> studied. <throat> like, well, for instance, this is a very good segue. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, we've been talking a lot about science fiction, and today is mm-hmm. a horror episode. Um, yes, it, it is our second Stephen King episode of the season and final. Um, we may do more in the future, but not this season. Mm-hmm. And um, the the movie is Misery, of which they resurrected that character for Castle Rock this season. Uh-huh. And the lady that played her studied and I mean studied um, Kathy Bates mannerisms, and you could tell. I mean, she captured the essence of Kathy Bates in her performance in Castle Rock. So what you're saying is oh, the guy yeah, that played definitely. Solo should have done the same thing with Harrison Ford. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Wow. That's an he, interesting uh, segue. I had no idea we would land there, but that's funny. That's kind of good. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, again... You've got, uh, and one of the things I will say about Misery, just as a, as a kind of a startup, is her performance is fantastic in this it's amazing. movie. And mm-hmm. it, it it is iconic, and it is memorable, and it does work. And so naturally, yeah, if you're going to revisit that in a new series decades later, you better go back to the source material mm-hmm. uh, and look at, at how that person was and keep that same kind of, you know, uh, because what they're doing with Castle Rock is trying to keep the same... I don't want to say homages. It's kind of like they're living in the same universe as all of Stephen King and including the movies. Wow. You know, cause there was, who was that girl you didn't like in the first season? Jackie Torrance. Yeah. Jackie you Torrance. Know, she was and, terrible. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, but there's, you know, the hop guy or the, 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 the head of the uh, mafia there, whatever, you know, that though, those characters. Pop Merrill. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, and we're in danger of slipping into a vortex that may send us back in time. On, um, but this is a JJ, <laughs> <laughs> this is a JJ Abrams project too. It's like keys are just exploding out of my head right now. True. <laughs> because this is JJ Abrams, Stephen King fixation, as opposed to JJ Abrams, Star Trek, I mean, Star Wars, uh, fixation. Right. Um, so, wow. <laughs> yeah, my head's spinning a little bit. So, let's dive into misery, though. Let's go back in time, like I said earlier, <laughs> yeah. to 1990 um, and a little 1990. movie mm-hmm. directed mm-hmm. by Rob Reiner, um, based on the best-selling novel by Stephen King. Um, mm-hmm. And it's basically um, a small film, the kind I like, with a very small cast. Or small story that is, and um, it's about a, a best-selling romance novelist. He's a period no- novelist. Um, I think he writes romance in like the Victorian era. Named Paul Sheldon, um, and he, it the movie starts with him finishing a novel that you think may be you know just another misery novel, but it turns out no, it's the novel he always wanted to write um, because he has recently killed off misery in. Um, a prior book, but we don't know that yet. And he is driving from, uh, he, he does his little final ritual for uh, finishing the book um, where he has a drink of champagne, smokes a cigarette, and then leaves this lodge up in the mountains where he normally writes his books. And it's snowy, and he has a car accident and is rescued by a very strong woman. She throws him up on her shoulders when she gets him out of the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, she takes him home and starts nursing him back to hell. She happens to be a nurse, but she also happens to be his number one fan. And uh, the plot kind of uh, unfolds there with him trapped in the house with her. Not only trapped um, by her, but he's also 
pretty much paralyzed because his legs were crushed in the uh, car accident. Mm-hmm. And um, Annie is not what all she appears to be. She at first appears to be a, um, a very nice um, person that is going to help this man, um, not a crazy person that ends up holding this man prisoner in her house. What do you think of that story? Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I had read Misery before I saw the movie, of course. And I really liked Annie Wilkes' character, and I liked Paul. The only thing that threw me off in the book was, you know, there's a lot more in the book trying to tie Misery Chastain, the fictional character, into Paul's world. There's a lot of fugue state writers stuff in there. When I was reading the book, I didn't really relate to that much. Uh, I think it was, uh, I think writers probably relate to it a lot more of what writer's block is like and what inspiration is like and how it takes you and all of that. Um, but I really liked the story because the, it's, a um, uh, it's an ominous dread story, which, you know, I like in horror. Uh, it's a very, you know, one of the keys that I'll just go ahead and say is it's a very Hitchcock kind of, of film the way Rob Reiner directed it. It's a, there's this sense of things aren't right from the very beginning and then there's little flashes and little hints and then they just gradually get worse and worse and when you think it's gotten just bad enough it gets worse and then it gets really bad with this huge memorable scene and then it gets even worse than that. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> yeah. You're going, oh my God. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I really, I really like the story. If I go back to the book, and it's been a while since I read it, the main difference I remember is that in the book, Annie is kind of a beast. She's very unattractive and very large, and I always pictured her mm -hmm. as more of an Anne Ramsey type than a Kathy Bates type. Um, Anne Ramsey. Oh, I can see that. Yeah, yep. she was an, a character actress from the 80s and, and earlier. Um, no longer with us. Uh, so they did. They, it, they did try to make Kathy Bates unattractive, but Kathy Bates is not an ugly woman. She's, you know, they just they kind of made her more wallflowerish with like a dorky hairstyle and dorky costuming, more so than yeah, I like making that. her repulsive. Like she was very repulsive in the book. Like. I want to say she had bad breath or she was always like spitting when she spoke or, you know, you know what I mean? She was very animal-esque. Yeah. But I think it makes it scarier that she has this nice side and that she does exactly. seem so wallflowerish and so timid and nice and will never say dirty, dirty words. She calls people, you know, poopy heads and stuff. Poopy and, head. and <laughs> Yeah. And, Mr. And, Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dirty bird, you dirty bird. Um, um, I can give you a bit of a background on the book and the movie. Um, it sure. was it was originally slated to be a Bachman book. Um, that was Stephen King's pseudonym. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I didn't know that. Before okay. he he was exposed and eventually owned it and just stopped putting Bachman books out. And, and put him back out under his name. Um, George Roy Hill was considered to direct, which I found interesting. Um, oh, yeah, and, that would have been interesting. And Reiner was going to produce it. And um, the only reason, uh, from what I understand, that it got made is King was not going to let it be made because there's a huge metaphoric element to the story about his story with addiction. So it was kind of like one of those books he wrote to get over something. And when he saw Stand By Me, he said the only person he would like to write that film is Rob Reiner. And so that's how Rob Reiner ended up with it. Hmm. Um, so, wait, why didn't Roy Hill want to do it? Um, I, I guess Roy Hill um, had a conflict. Because Reiner was going to okay. produce it, he was going to produce it and let Roy and 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 I think King was okay with that because Rob was still involved. But something happened where Roy Hill could not um, do it, and so Rob ended up doing it. Okay, um, okay. 
Um, of course, it's also – the screenplay was written by William Goldman, who uh, is just a phenomenal brilliant. screenwriter. And he oh, yeah. is the one that suggested Kathy Bates because no one knew who they were going to cast. And he had seen her on Broadway um, and had some affiliation with some Broadway stuff. He knew her somehow, and he suggested her. And then, of course, Barry Sonnefeld did the cinematography, and he is also a director of some pretty major yeah, movies. Yeah, he did there. Men in Black. Right. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of power behind this film. <laughs> I mean, you've got King, Goldman, Reiner, and Sonnenfeld. Yeah, I mean, that was gonna, that's in my notes first, is that, in addition to the cast, is, I mean, these are all like powerhouse people all mm-hmm. together at the same time. I mean, William Goldman did, you know, Papillon and All the President's Men and Butch Cassidy and the Sunnets Kid. I mean, he's just a great writer. He did Magic, that, too. Remember that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Magic. It, well, and some of the, I was going to say some of the lesser ones that I really like. Great Waldo Pepper, I really like. Uh, mm-hmm. Magic, Marathon Man, mm-hmm. you know, but he also did, you know, Princess Bride. Right. So he can do lighthearted, fun stuff, too. Um, but then you've got Rob Reiner, who comes from, of course, Hollywood pedigree with his father, Carl, and all the family and all that. Um, but James Kahn, who, you know, came from The Godfather. Kathy Bates, who was kind of unknown, but known on Broadway. She had I done think some, the only film actress. I recall before that with her in it was Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean. Jimmy yeah, Dean. I think so. Yeah, that's and that was and a big then, part. That was not a, a big part at all. And you know, supporting cast: Anne Bancroft, Francis Sternhagen, Richard Farnsworth, who is brilliant in this it's, too. He's really good. You meant Lauren Bacall, not Anne Bancroft. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, not yeah. not Anne Bancroft, Lauren Bacall. Yeah, mm-hmm. she's fabulous. I mean, uh, she brings that old movie clout to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I just think everybody associated with it. I mean, I don't see if I was the studio head, I would just sit back and go, "Yep, yeah, this one's going to work." Uh, you know, because we normally you normally have casting stuff. If yeah. There was James. I mean, was Kathy Bates once Goldman said, hey, I want her. Was that a done deal or uh, did they cat- try, try other people? Well, they they had they did audition other people or at least um, consider other people. I don't know if they actually auditioned. Um, hmm. Hang on. There were uh, there was actually more in line for the Paul Sheldon character than the Annie Wilkes character, but three that were, well, actually several that were up, were Jessica Lang, um, Barbara Streisand, um, Angelica Houston was actually offered the part, but she had to turn it down because she was in the Grifters at the time. Mm-hmm. That that's an odd choice, I thought. That's a very odd choice. I was just yeah. thinking that. I don't, I, I don't see how I, I would, I would like that. <laughs> um, apparently, at one time, it was offered to Bette Midler, and she turned it down and said she regretted it, that it was a stupid thing to do. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of funny. Um, yes. But the, uh, one of the people that campaigned, you're gonna love this, was Mary Tyler Moore. She oh my God. It. Ooh. <laughs> well, you know, in Ordinary People, she showed a lot of chops. So it would have been interesting to see, you know, the audience perception would have been, oh, she's nice, sweet Mary. Uh, oh, Mr. Grant. And then to see her right. lose it and start screaming might have been pretty scary. It could have been. So I just could don't have see been. skinny people doing that part because she has I to don't be either. able to lift him. I mean, she has to be strong. Yes. But um and then three minors that were considered also are Vicky Lawrence, Roseanne, and Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> oh please. Yeah, no, let's don't go there. Now, I could, those. I no. could see Rosie O'Donnell out of the three of those maybe, but not, not Well yeah, Kathy. because she reminds you of Kathy Bates. Right. You know, I mean. mm-hmm. <laughs> and she can be really friendly and really dark too. I could see mm, that. Yeah, true. Yeah, really rude. Um that. But I have a feeling that somehow when Bette Midler and Angelica Houston turned it down, that must be somewhere where Goldman stepped in and said, check this girl out, and it was Kathy Bates. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Now, um, for the James Conroll, Paul Sheldon part, um, 
Jack Nicholson passed on it. He said, I don't want to do any more Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was kind of funny. But, I mean, he would have been good in it. He would have mm-hmm. definitely been good in it. Um, Bill Murray was considered. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, but then again, I've got a whole list of people now that are going to blow your mind because most of them are not great. Um, Tim okay. Allen, <laughs> Robin Williams, um, mm-hmm. Jeff Daniels, Ed Harris, John Hurd, Robert Klein. Ugh. No. That's just horrible. That terrible. Um, yeah. And then Ed O'Neill was considered, and I would have really liked to have seen a take of him doing it. I, I think Ed O'Neill could have maybe pulled it off. Well, Ed Harris could have too. Right, right. Yeah. And maybe even Jeff Daniels, but not Robin Williams or Tim Allen. Um, right. No, no, no. Um, it was offered to these people that turned it down. Ned, I mean, not Ned Beatty, Warren Beatty. Uh, okay. Robert, Robert De Niro, uh, Michael Douglas, Richard Dreyfus, Harrison Ford, Morgan Freeman, Mel Gibson, Gene Hackman, Dustin Hoffman, um, William Hurt twice. They tried to get him twice. He would be great. Yeah, he he would have been, been good. He would have been good. Uh, Kevin Klein, Al Pacino, Robert Redford, Denzel Washington, and Bruce Willis, who later played it on Broadway with, um, wow. you know, what's her face from Roseanne, the Broadway actress. I cannot think of her name right now. Oh, the, the one that's her sister. Yeah. 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 She did it on Broadway with Bruce Willis a couple of years back. Um, she's also Sheldon's mom. And then, um, who else? I have that Carol Burnett was considered for the Lauren Bacall role. I can handle that. <laughs> yeah, that I could mean, have been good. Yeah. Lauren just brought the clout of, you know, the star system to it. She's, you know, she was mm-hmm. one of the last. So. And yep. um, I don't have anything else for uh, the Virginia role, which was Francis Sternhagen, or Buster, which was Richard Farnsworth. Um, I have, um, under casting, this is, um, not really casting so much as it is music, but Mark Shannon did the music. Are you familiar with him? Mm -hmm. I'm not. Okay. He did, um, Beaches and Mary Poppins Returns and Hairspray. I mean, he's got a pretty strong track record. Um, he okay. used to do the music for like all the Oscars and the Tonys. He did all that orchestration too. Hmm. So okay. he must have been friends with Rob through one of those guilds or something. Is what I'm thinking. Yep, that could have been. Yeah. I could see that. So, and he he also did Sleepless in Seattle and When Harry Met Sally. So they were friends, obviously. Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Rob Reiner does a small uh, cameo as the helicopter pilot. If you blink, you'll miss him. He's got sunglasses on. <laughs> oh, with Farnsworth when they're when the, the sheriff when they're looking for, for right, the, right, the right. car. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's my I heavy did duty that. casting notes there. Lots of people. Lots of people up for them. Um, and no. What about the? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would have chased that part too. I, I don't see why so many people turned it down. That's kind of crazy. Um, I had a question, and you may you may know this because I could not have a reference to it. Uh, and I, it's probably in the book, I'm sure, whatever, because the movie at the very end for the epilogue says 18 months later. So after the ordeal, 18 months later is when the scene in the restaurant. But how long was Paul missing? How long was he with Annie? I mean, more than a couple of months, right? I would say at I least mean, a month, maybe a little more. Well, because he had time for his facial cuts to all heal. Mm-hmm. He well, he his had legs had healed, 
And she had to re-injure <clears throat> them, too. His legs were healing. Were healing, but he was still hobbling around and crawling or in mm-hmm. his wheelchair, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, what about... Um, 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 and he wrote the novel. So that wasn't overnight, of course. Yeah, but what else um, did he have to do? There was no TV. Well, he true. Was just, that's all he had to do. Yeah, I would be curious. I, I, I wish they'd given us some kind of date reference when he was finally rescued. You know, even if we had just heard somebody say, after, you know, presumed dead for three months or whatever kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I, that's just one of my questions that I have there. We talked about performance, uh, I guess, a little bit. You know, it was it was hard for me because, you know, Godfather is probably my favorite film ever. And it's hard for me to see James Caan in any other role rather than Sonny. Um, so it's still it, it, in the first couple of scenes, it was difficult for me to get into him as Paul. Uh, finally did. And it was fine. But it, it, it just took me a little bit. Whereas Kathy Bates just. You know, even watching it again now, it had been so long since I've seen it before, uh, got right into her. She was just, I think she, the way he does those close-ups of her at the beginning, and she's like, it's Paul's POV looking down on him, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're aware, uh, there was some conflict between the two. Um, Khan no. is Khan is a very um, spontaneous actor he oh yeah he, yeah he hates I, i'm to not rehearse. sure what yeah i don't know what that method is but he's not into rehearsals he's like wanting to just spout it out and she is yep. like methodical and like over rehearses everything well, and, probably broadway training right theater training. And rob reiner said that the challenge with directing the two of them was to find the balance between both and to use that that tension between them to his advantage as far as their relationship. Well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I thought so too. Um, But I kind of felt for her because it was, you know, her first big movie. And here she is opposite some guy that disrespects the way she works. And I'm like, well, good. F you. I want an Oscar. (laughs) You know? Well, yeah, at the very end, she can, yeah. she can look back and say, hey, I won an Oscar for it. Right, you know? right. Which is it's crazy, too. You know, mm-hmm. I, I mean, she I don't know who she was up against, but I know that year, that there were big movies that year. Ghost was that year, and Dances yeah. with Wolves was that year. So I don't know who she was actually nominated against, but she obviously blew him away. Yeah, I can tell you. I, so, I didn't write it down, but I'll look briefly um because it was some stellar people because it was the same year whoopi won for ghost as a a what do you call it supporting actress supporting yeah right uh i do think uh while you're looking that up Mm -hmm. i i do think overall um let's turn to the writing and the adaptation thing um i do think it's a great adaptation of the book i do think it keeps all of the the major moments and, and tensions in the book, uh, plot wise, uh, there's a lot. Uh, I like the cutting back and forth because you really start feeling for the sheriff and trying to find her, and the fact that he's almost, you know, the only one that still hold uh, find him. He's the only one that still holds out hope, uh, you know, uh, just because of certain clues that he's seen, and. Um, of course, the most you know memorable scene in it we can talk about later, but you know it's it's in there and definitely is horribly memorable, even though it's adapted differently than it's different than what happens in the book. It's still just as horrible. Maybe worse. Um, but but I do have that uh, in my notes. I have that. Her coming back for that very, very final, final jump scare was very cheap. That one I didn't like. I thought that one was very, uh, very cliche compared to the rest of the story. Um, so, so I didn't, I didn't like that element of it. I keep finding, um, I keep finding um, who the winner is. I'm not seeing who she was up against. Uh, best I, 
Yeah. Um, hmm. Oh, okay. This is great radio, I'm sure. Um, let's talk about some scenes while I'm doing this. I mean, this is a horror movie. Okay. So what do you think mm -hmm. are some of the more horrific elements, other than the fact that he's being held against his will? Well, what I like about it, again, is what I said at the beginning. It's very Hitchcockian to me. It's a very slow burn, tension sort of sort of film all the way through. And I like the way you slowly see Khan realize something's not right about her at first. And it's just like, you know, getting mad and spilling the soup. And then almost getting mad enough to hit him with a chair, but not hitting it against the wall instead and breaking it, you know. And, and he suddenly realized, oh, shit, I need to get out of here. This is not <laughs> this is not going to be good. Um, and to me, that was very horrific and very scary. Um, him, you know, the, the tension and suspense amazing. of him leaving the room mm -hmm. for the first time. And the whole time you're going, no, 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 get back in the room, get back, she's going to be back any minute. You know, and the fact that it, tele you know, Goldman's screenplay telegraphs so much, like him dropping the penguin and then putting it back. And, you know, if you're an astute movie person, you know, you notice immediately that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. I have it um, now, um, and, if you want me to interject. Yeah. Uh, Kathy Bates yeah, beat out Angelica Houston for The Grifters, which is ironic. Um, mm -hmm. She beat out Julia yeah. Roberts for Pretty Woman. She beat out Meryl wow. Streep for Postcards on the Edge. And she beat Joanne Woodward for Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. That's some major, mm. major people. Yeah, that's some major people. Mm -hmm. You know, And for her to be the lead in a horror movie, even more so. Right. That's pretty good. Okay. Um, uh, back to what you were saying uh, um, earlier, and this is a, this is a huge key, and I'm not sure if you're aware of it. You mentioned how Hitchcockian cocky in this movie is. R Rob Reiner, mm -hmm. <clears throat> he said he identified with the story of this movie because he felt like he was being typecast when he was on All in the Family as Meathead, the you know the comedic relief or whatever, and. Um, so mm -hmm. he said he identified with Paul Sheldon wanting to escape from that box. But he said he had never directed a horror film. He had only been known for like romantic comedies. And he wanted to um, study the best. And so he watched every Hitchcock movie and like just absorbed himself mm. in Hitchcock. <laughs> and, and you can – I never really realized it back when you know the movie first came out. But upon this viewing – I noticed it so much, especially since we just did Psycho not too long ago. I mean, that whole scene where he is out rolling around in his wheelchair and bumping into things and catching things, falling off tables and stuff. I was like, this is so Hitchcock. You know, hiding hiding the mm -hmm, pills very. in the mattress, slipping the knife under the mattress. That's, yep. All that stuff was like, oh, this is so suspenseful. Yeah. Yeah, you could tell he uh, had studied a master and was and was working towards that goal of achieving those effects. And the way she, yeah, and the way it's written slowly so that you see this unhingedness of mm -hmm. Annie, and you don't really know then how to react because you don't know how she's going to react, and you start feeling for him about what do you say, how do you say, what do you, how do you take a criticism, how do you do a criticism, and then. The, the key points of like she gets his new book the book that he knows misery dies in and you're just going gonna, oh my god yeah. and instead of just immediately she goes oh i'm on page <laughs> only 20 pages oh, left so <laughs> yeah yeah oh, and you're going shit. oh shh. oh my god oh my god and then the way they do it with just that door opening and her standing there going you dirty bird and you're going oh right. hell <laughs> Uh, um, we were talking but the way about they do that, horrific and... scenes. The thing that got me the most is when she brings the barbecue grill in and says, you know, basically, you're going to burn your book. Oh. And, I mean, that's that's a nightmare to anyone who writes, period. But when yes. he starts talking about yeah, yeah. having additional copies elsewhere and all this, and she just casually just starts slinging the lighter fluid on the bed. On and the I bed, am like yeah. P 
pissing my pants. I'm like, this is one of the most horrifying yeah. things I've ever seen in my life. Because she's basically saying, I'm going to burn you alive without saying it at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's just yeah, I love the way that was done. that lighter fluid. <sighs> and, and it's just, it, it, it flows very well, the storytelling. You know, we, we start rooting for Paul to, you know, save his pills and be able to drug mm-hmm. her. You know, and then she spills it and you're going, oh, my God, we're going to have to start mm-hmm. all over. Uh, you know, whatever. Um, the, the, the hope when the, the sheriff is there. Uh, and, and it's just the way it's told is so compelling and great as a, as, as a good mm-hmm. horror movie. Well, it's, it's written like a play um, because it's just two people in one room. So a lot of it, I noticed that a lot of their acting is to a camera because they're not in the same shot together. Did you notice that? Right. Oh, yeah. He does a lot mm-hmm. of close-ups. He does a lot of that, uh, um, you know, almost like Silence of the Lambs right. kind of mm-hmm. close-up photography. Well, but not only that, but, you know, the stuff with the sheriff, too. You know, he walks down the snowbank, and he's just literally feet away but doesn't see the tire. You know, that kind of suspense works for me, too. Him trying to get into the whole character, uh, you know, him watching Annie... Um, you know, get mad at the driver in town and walk into the store. Mm-hmm. It's just, again, he reminded, again, Hitchcock, the NT, it reminded me of, what was it, Arbogast? Yeah, the detective. In Psycho. The detective figuring you things know. out. Right, yeah. right. Right, and then the way he dies is just literally blown away. Just, oh, he went, what right. the? <laughs> in the book, wasn't he run over with a lawnmower, I think? Like a riding lawnmower, it was kind of silly. Yeah, in the book it yeah. was weird. She did like two or three things to him. She like killed. She like shot him. Then as he was realized that he wasn't dead, trying to get away, and she yeah. ran over. Uh, and that was a little bit kingy extreme. Right, right. But um, um, I, I love that he figured it out by the quote that he read in a misery book about there being a higher mm-hmm. source of being judged by or whatever, meaning God. And then you see that he. He finds that picture of her in the paper when she's on trial or whatever for murdering babies that she says, I will be judged by that higher source. And he was like, bingo. You know, it's like he knew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I loved how they did that. And I liked I liked the fact that they give Annie, you know, about halfway through, you start thinking Annie, Annie's maybe smarter than we think. And. Maybe she's, you know, I started even thinking maybe she's even stalked him from the very, could she have arranged for the car accident in the first place? I wondered that. Because she says, you know, she watched, she would just drive by there sometimes and park and just watch him. You talk about creepy. You know, and you're you're going, oh my God, oh my God, she's a stalker. Um, And, you know, do you think she knew about Paul's first excursion? Because the first thing she, he's been out several times, you get the impression enough to get all the pills and all that stuff. You get the impression he's been out a few times um, after he does that first one. And yet when she finally reveals to him that she knew he's been walking around, the first thing she mentioned was her penguin, which is the first thing he did the first day or the first trip. Um, So maybe she's known the whole time. Maybe she knew enough that he would try to drug her, and that's why she dropped her wine glass. You know, I started thinking those kind of things. I was going, is she smarter than we think she is? Or is it just luck? that He just has horrible bad luck. <laughs> well, it, she is smart, though. Um, and I love when um, he starts writing that book and she comes in and she says, nah, this won't do. You have to start from here because this is where you left off. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'm like, bitch. <laughs> but she's right. I mean, she's totally right. And goes off on that big story of, of of whatever about watching that series or whatever, and they they didn't start the next season the same way or the next book. Right, like, yeah. because he wasn't in the cockadoodie car. Um, <laughs> the cockadoodie car. It was car, some yeah. cereal. It was some cereal they were talking about cliffhangers or whatever chapter cereals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Oh. Um. Uh, and I think another difference I just remembered, and I'm not sure I'd have to research it, so correct me out there in, in listening land if I'm wrong, but I, I think in the book, doesn't he write Misery Returns? He does write another Misery book. 
I think, in the book. Yeah, he does. Before he writes. Oh, no, okay. no, 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 no. Okay. Not, I don't think it's before. I think it's because she makes him. But he, I think in the in the book, in the epilogue, um, he's written his novel that he likes and right. everything else. But that was the second one he wrote after after uh, rehabilitating. He actually wrote a Misery Returns. I thought that he just. I think I, I, may be I wrong. thought he published the one that he wrote when he was with her, but I can't remember. And maybe you're right. Oh, maybe he, maybe that's it. Maybe he did, but no, he burned it. Remember? And stuffed, and stuffed it, it down, down her throat. throat. Right. So maybe you're right. Yeah, which it's been a good. long time. Which again, since, I mean, I that think book, was a good that scene. book came out in 1986, I think. It's been a while since I read it. So, so we're talking about horror, and I guess the, the the biggest culmination of this movie of horror is its most memorable scene, which is the 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 hobbling. Mm-hmm. Scene. And what did you think of that? Um, well, I was a little upset at first that they didn't do the actual amputation like they did in the book. But me too. The, the way they set it up, though, now when I watch it, I'm like, nah, they didn't have to. It's perfect. And then when you find out oh, she's yeah. going to do it's, the it's other so... one, it's like living through the first one was bad enough. Then she switches, you know, hands and goes for the other one. It'll yeah. all be over soon, Paul. Just yeah. a minute. And it's like, oh my God, no, Annie, no, And Dennis, no, no. Dennis yeah, actually watched this one with me because he had been watching um, Castle Rock and I, he had gotten his curiosity up. Mm. So um, he couldn't watch that part. He was like, he had his hands up over his face. <laughs> we, okay, question. When did he realize what she was going to do? Um, I think that he had probably seen scenes, you know, because that movie's been around a while, so oh, he probably okay. knew something like that was coming. But I mean, he was criticizing it from oh, okay. the get go. Like he he's a big car nut, and he was like, uh, "This is not believable. Nobody's gonna be flying around on snowy mountain roads in a fucking Mustang." <laughs> he's like, "There's no traction," <laughs> and, and so <laughs> when he wrecked, he was like, "Okay, now it's believable." Because he wrecked. Yeah. Now it's believable, yeah. And then <laughs> but he, he also, <laughs> he, and this is a key, he also pointed out that in the Castle Rock series, she also drives a Jeep Cherokee. It's just a newer model. And she drove a Jeep Cherokee. In the oh. Movie. And that's just J.J. Abrams' attention to detail. But um, leave it to Dennis to notice that. Ooh. I didn't notice it at all. <clears throat> I didn't notice that. No. I like the way the epilogue is done as a kind of a a, a jump scare, but not a mm-hmm. jump scare. The waitress bringing the the you know coming by and everything, and it being Annie, and then suddenly it's well, not. and it's also saying that he's got to live with that for the rest of his life. Uh, you know, he's going to be seeing her yeah. in places for the rest of his life. Yeah. And I think the fact that he doesn't flinch, that he just accepts it, he doesn't cower in fear and all of that kind of stuff. He just accepts, oh, I'm hallucinating again. Great. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I'm going to see reminders of her for the rest of my life kind of thing. That was great. And I loved how Lauren Um, Call said, have you ever considered putting it into a book? (laughs) Like a true agent would say mm -hmm. that. (laughs) You know, and and what was his response? Something like, oh, yeah, so you want me to take the most horrible thing in my life and relive it? Yeah. (laughs) Good idea, just for money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the only other thing I've got in my notes was it's bad enough that when he pulled the knife out of his cloth sling, it made a sound like a knife coming out of a sheath across metal, but then he did it two more times. <laughs> I'm like, okay, really, sound editor guy? You should be fired for mm-hmm. that. Um um, I have a bit of trivia. I already told you about um, Stephen King saying that this novel is a metaphor for his addiction with drugs, that Annie was basically a metaphor for his addiction. Um, yeah, I didn't get that at all, even when I read the book or even watched well, the movie. Well, we time. didn't know a lot about his drug or addiction time. until much later. I mean, it, they kind of kept that a secret for a while. Um, you learn about most of it when that book on writing came out in the early 2000s, and he starts talking about like because okay. he talked about how his family had an intervention with him and and how much he drank and and did coke. He did a lot of coke. Um, but another trivial thing that I okay. have is that 
Um, you know, I said Jack Nicholson turned down this role. James Caan turned down yeah. Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Well, there you go. Um, and, and then yep. um, Kathy Bates is the first actress to win for a horror movie. And the first actor to win for a horror movie was Frederick March in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in 1931. <laughs> That's a long time. Wow. Yeah. And now, of course, others have come up, like Ruth Gordon in um, Rosemary's Baby, Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins, Silence of the Lambs, and, of course, Natalie Portman in Black Swan. All of those are horror movies as well. But... But Kathy right. was the first. Mm-hmm. That's great. And she not only won an Oscar, Horror she Legacy. won a Golden Globe, and she also won whatever a 2020 award is. And I've mentioned before the uh, AFI's villain list and um, how Darth Vader, Norman Bates, and um, Hannibal Lecter are in the top three. Um, she is number 17. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's down, but she's oh, on really? that list. <laughs> yeah, she is. That's great. Mm-hmm. So that's really um, a lot of what I have as far as background. Um, we've talked scenes. Uh, really, the only thing I know is we can move on to some keys, if we have any other keys that we haven't mentioned. Yep. Um, um, I do not have any other ones other than those. Okay. Um, um, I do have it. I mean, a key for me personally, I guess, is it is one of the better horror movies I could recommend out there, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, I think it's palpable for most people, and but it's also a realistic horror that I think lingers. Well, with, it's you know, also more mainstream. You know, it's not supernatural horror. It's it's Some people can't wrap themselves right. around the fantasy element of horror movies, or fantasy movies in general, whereas some people could watch this because it's more sense. realistic. Yeah. Yep, yeah. makes sense. Um, most of the keys I had, we mentioned, um, Castle Rock, obviously, the show, um, the the Broadway mm-hmm. production. Um, oh, her name is Laurie Metcalf with Bruce Willis and Laurie Metcalf. Yeah, and, Laurie Metcalf. And I think yep. she was probably really sense. good in yep. that as well. And then we mentioned Hitchcock and how Reiner studied all those in prep. Um, there are some mm-hmm. specific Hitchcocks. Um, Psycho immediately comes to mind. Uh, rear window comes to mind when he's rolling around in that wheelchair. Um, oh, of course. Just and then yep. and then the suspense elements, you know, of strangers in a train and, and things like that as well. Um, but the only other key mm-hmm. that I have off the top of my head is kind of a personal key for Stephen King. Um, he liked Kathy Bates in this movie so much that he wrote Dolores Claiborne for her. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? The movie the, or the book? He wrote, he wrote the, the book, book for her? For her, and she ended up playing it in the movie. Probably, I'm sure he influenced that somehow. Yeah. Wow. I did mm-hmm. not know that. So that's a direct um, that's a direct key of many elements. It's a writing key. It's a casting key. Um, it's a political key, <laughs> because I'm sure politics played into uh, her being in the movie. Um, mm-hmm. But... Uh, yeah, other ones, I don't have um, really any more keys. I hate that we didn't mention some of the, the minor characters a little more. I love Buster and uh, Francis Sternhagen's rapport. Uh, they crack me up. I think they're hysterical. Yeah, but I think he's great all the way mm-hmm. through it, too. His suspense is great. His suspicion works. He's a good old boy. But even from his very first line about, well, I'm the sheriff and the... You know, I'm, and I'm the both. Deputy, and the mayor, or whatever, <laughs> yeah, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that she's always make, doing a little sexual innuendo with him and stuff. They're just like this really cute old couple. And and then then he gets killed, and you never see what happens to her. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's kind of sad. <laughs> yeah. 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 But all right, well, I think that uh, pretty much wraps it up for misery. Um. I think we hit yeah. the, the major scenes. We didn't we, talk about how he crushed her head with a typewriter. I thought that was kind of a poetic um, way to kill her. Yeah, that whole hit her head. And if that had been the end of it, I would have been fine. But then they did that last jump scare, and I didn't mm-hmm. like that. But other right. than that. Right, right. I don't good. think you would get up from um, uh, that. 
So. Yeah. Uh, no. 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 Sir. Nope, no. You but, um, good. But we both we both obviously recommend this movie. Mm-hmm. So. That's a that's Absolutely. a good thing. And um, and all of you out there listening, if you recommend it or you like it or you don't like it, let us know. We'd love yeah. to hear from you. And we so, want to know why you don't like give, it. Yeah. <laughs> Or why you do like it, why you agree with us, you know, kind of thing. What, you know, um, and uh, be sure to like us and rate us yes. and review us and uh, uh, subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app. You can always uh, like or follow us on Facebook and uh, Twitter, and sometimes I have stuff up on Instagram. Um, and I guess that's gonna be it until we see you folks next time. Well, and I'd also like to recommend, you know, Patreon to oh, yeah. and say become a Patreon supporter. You know, one of the things that Tim and I have said from the very beginning is we don't want the podcast to be a bunch of advertising and a bunch of ads and sponsored by and all of that. Uh, so it's you guys that are keeping us going. So please join us. Yeah, Patreon, if you please. like Star Trek, it's so. the place to be. We've got um, several episodes of the Dilithium Chamber up now, um, and we're doing the first oh, season yeah. of the original Star Trek series. So. Tune in. Tune in. And Tim, until next time, I guess I'll see you, you know, later when we do another uh, great Sounds movie. Sounds good. Week.